Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the seminar called Yes, You Can a Brand. So just a quick note about our firm. Um, we're a full service intellectual property law firm. We only practice intellectual property law and we can assist anybody with patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, both prosecution and litigation. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my, I personally generally dabble only in, in trademarks, uh, US and foreign prosecution. Um, and I'm very excited to present on this topic today. So I know that there's many of you in this room that probably already know a lot about trademarks, but even so, um, I think there's always value in uh, revisiting and especially for those of you that may not know as much. So I just wanted to cover a little bit, uh, cover the basics just a little bit. So um, I just think that trademarks is very interesting. It's a concept really. It's, it's like a word or phrase, which is how most people view them. And it's something that identifies or distinguishes the source of goods or services of one company or person from those of another. And it's just, it's, it's actually like thinking about it as a nebulous concept, like it, and it's extremely powerful because uh, consumers every day, like look at trademarks and rely on trademarks to kind of help them, you know, make purchasing decisions and all sorts of other things. So the, 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 the point of a trademark is to create the connection between the trademark itself and the product or service that it represents. And in, in essence, it serves as what's called an indicator of the source. So uh, what are some functions and values of a trademark? Because I, I get this question all the time. Um, just quickly, uh, they, trademarks distinguish goods and services from one business and another business. Um, trademarks create an association between the quality of a product and a source. So like kind of an example of that would be, you have a view of the quality of a Honda Accord as opposed to the view of a quality of a Lamborghini. Both are cars. Um, those are two different trademarks. And when you think of a Honda Accord and you're kind of comparing it to something like a Lamborghini, you have a different vision of what kind of car you're getting, what kind of quality you're getting, what, how does it run, what does it look like, you know, what do people even think about it? So that's kind of the power of a trademark. Um, other things that trademarks do is they help to protect reputation of sources of the product of goods and services. Um, this is a big one, um, which is the consumer marketing facing part, which is consumers rely on trademarks in making purchasing decisions. Um, that's how like there's like a hundred, maybe a thousand different brands of shampoo. You know, how do you pick the shampoo? Well, usually people before they've even tried it, they're going to look at like the packaging and the trademark and then they're going to remember that or when they get a recommendation, they're going to recommend they're going to people are going to recommend it by brand by the trademark. Um, trademarks help in the, in the marketing of goods and services. And most importantly, if you're a business owner, um, trademarks help ensure that as the owner of a business that you get the financial rewards associated with the development of your brand and of your trademark. So trademarks are really important for any business, um, regardless of whether you're selling products or if you're providing services. So um, what's interesting about US law is that US law is in my view, just having you know worked with the laws of many other countries is one of the most detailed and comprehensive uh, trademark laws out there. And, be, and, and most people, when they think of a trademark, they think of something generally like a word, a phrase, or a, a logo. But under US law, they really are have a very broad interpretation of what can be a trademark. And as long as you can kind of show that what you're trying to trademark serves as a designator of source, you can typically typically get a trademark for that. So just to give, and this is just to give an idea of what I mean by the, um, like the source identifier part. Some of these are very obvious. We're gonna say, well, of course I know the source of Burberry is, is Burberry, right? Well, how about the source of a phrase? Uh, what about what's in your wallet? Well, the source of that phrase, and we know it's said by Mr. Samuel L. Jackson, well, that one is capital one, right? Um, the golden arches. We don't even, there's not even a word here. It's just a picture of a, of a yellow M and that yellow M, like when you drive by and your kids start to scream in the car, McDonald's. So an example of a stylized word mark would be like the Whole Foods, which is obvious it's the source is Whole Foods and the extremely ubiquitous all over the place Starbucks, place Starbucks. is Starbucks. Uh, so those are kind of the most standard trademarks, but other things can be a trademark too. So if, uh, you know, if your significant other comes home with this beautiful blue box, you're going to get very excited because it's from Tiffany. 
So Tiffany has a trademark on this blue box for jewelry and for all the other um, home, I guess, like home decor items that they sell. When you see this box, you expect the inside of it to be a Tiffany product. You can trademark sounds. Uh, here's one that's trademarked. So I, I don't know if the sound came through, but it's basically woohoo. And the woohoo is a trademark of Pillsbury. And uh, recently, you, uh, uh, Play-Doh was successfully able to trademark their scent. So when you, if you close your eyes and you open a, a jar of Play-Doh and you take a whiff, it has a very distinct smell. And they've trademarked that because Play-Doh is like very ubiquitous. So the owner of the trademark is Hasbro. Um, you know, that's to like distinguish them from like other generic, like molding dough. The generic name for Play-Doh is actually molding dough, Play-Doh being the trademark and the smell being a trademark. Um, these types of trademarks are harder to obtain because they require something called secondary meaning and you're going to have to kind of show additional proof in order to get them, but they are certainly obtainable. Um, other kinds of things that can be a trademark. You can trademark a color. This color is owned by T-Mobile. So that means that only T-Mobile and not Sprint and not Verizon and not AT&T, all of which also have their own kind of color that they're associated with. Sprint is yellow, T-Mobile is pink. Uh, AT&T is a blue and Verizon is red, but uh, T-Mobile owns this color trademark. You could trademark the shape of a product. Uh, in this case, it's, and usually we see a word in there, it's owned by intercontinental great brands, but everybody knows that this is an Oreo cookie. So if you wanted to sell um, a black and white cookie, you know, in the same shape, you could not use that very distinctive print and you certainly would not put Oreo on it, but everybody would kind of have an idea that that probably tastes like an Oreo, but it's not an Oreo. You can uh, trademark the inside of a store design. So uh, this trademark, if you walk by in a mall, it's all glass, it's very distinctive. It's owned by Apple. So mm -hmm. Apple has a trademark for the way that they set up their store. Um, so yeah, these are certainly, it just goes to show you how broad US trademark law is and kind of accepting what could be a designator of source. So I also get, I also get this question a lot uh, from, <coughs> from people, you know, why does my business need a registered trademark? Well, you know, actually under US law, there is like a, there's something called common law protection. So in, 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 in theory, like, yeah, you, I guess you don't really have to file for a trademark registration in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. But the problem with uh, common law protection is that your protection is gonna be limited in essence to geographic areas where the products or services are sold or provided. And now that you got it, can, you're gonna have to keep records of that. So if you're ever involved in an action or you're gonna have to keep uh, records as to, um, as to uh, you know, where you've sold it and how you've sold it, as opposed to um, you know, if, you've, if you've just registered that trademark for federal protection, you're just gonna automatically get countrywide uh, protection. So um, that's just like benefit. So it's like one filing and you get this really broad protection. And it's, uh, and, and once you file that trademark, you get additional benefits from and legal advantages from the United yeah. States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, you can use circle R in connection with your uh, registered trademark. You are not permitted to use circle R for uh, if you don't have a trademark registration for those specific goods. So you, if, even if you have a trademark registration, that's unless those goods are listed in your registration, you can't just start using that circle R. Um, you can use TM for anything. You can use TM for a trademark that you're using but haven't filed, and you can use TM for a trademark that you filed and haven't registered. And even sometimes people will use TM on a registered trademark because they're in the process of updating the packaging, and that's that's fine too. And the TM kind of in, it like informs people that you're claiming use, uh, sorry, you're claiming trademark rights into into a trademark. Um, this is also another question that I frequently get from people and I think it's worth covering because a lot of people actually believe that once we file the trademark application that, that everything is done and now they have a registration and that's it. But actually there's a process in filing the, in the trademark and um, it's generally similar in most countries. Um, this is the way the US works. I'll cover the two most frequent use, use basis, but just to give an overview for those of you who may not be familiar with the process, what to expect after filing. So once the application is filed, and this is assuming that there's already use of this trademark in commerce, and by use, I mean the product is being sold or the service is being provided, it's gonna go to the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office to be examined by uh, United States Patent USPTO examiner. And I wanna mention, because this will come up later, but the 
USPTO examiners are attorneys by trade. They are all licensed uh, attorneys in, in a jurisdiction in the United States. So they're like, um, they're educated people, they're very intelligent, and they know what they're doing. And I just want to point out that this is not the same in every country because other countries, they don't, they, there's no prerequisite that you're an attorney in order to be an examiner, actually. So some countries are really just like, I would call them bureaucrats. They're just government employees. They may have been trained, but they certainly aren't attorneys. Um, so anyway, so the uh, USPTO examining attorney is going to examine your application, and then they're going to determine whether or not, um, you know, whether or not you need to comply with additional requirements in order to move your trademark application uh, forward further. So if they do deem that you have additional requirements, um, they'll issue an office action and there's various types. There's some that are um, just formalities. You just have to kind of fix a couple of things, some wording or add a disclaimer. Those are usually fairly reasonably simple. Um, but then there's substantive refusals where they'll check the register and they'll tell you if they view something to be um, potentially confusingly similar, or if something is descriptive or like a variety of others. And then um, to move forward, you're going to have to submit a response and that response could could require one or more. Um, and there's a separate like appeals process, for example, if you're not happy or you can't get it through. If you don't file a response then, um, or you decide not to, yeah, if you decide not to file a response or you just can't overcome the refusal, um, the application will go to abandonment. Um, if in most cases we do successfully file the response, um, once the response is filed, it goes to publication, and then there's a 30-day publication period for any interested third party that may have uh, that may wish to oppose the application. And I just also want to stress for people that haven't like filed applications or aren't familiar with the process, uh, oppositions are generally fairly rare, and we do try to guard against them by um, conducting searches before we do filing. So. You know, it's it's not like I don't want people to be afraid and think that there's going to get an opposition just because we publish. They have don't happen in most cases, um, you know, but they do happen sometimes. Um, and you know, not all of them. Most of them don't even go in any way close to being to, through to conclusion. Sometimes you could just amend your application, um, and the other party will be happy. Once you've passed that 30-day period, you get your certificate of registration, and then you'll have maintenance requirements uh, going forward. And in theory, you can keep a trademark alive in perpetuity. So that's the uh, use and commerce basis. Um, the intent to use basis allows people to reserve the right in into a trademark without using that trademark, um, but you're ultimately gonna have to perfect your use because under US trademark law, they require use in order to you know, secure or maintain a trademark. And that, that's actually a good thing because it keeps the reg trademark register legitimate. Um, the main difference between the intent to use basis and the use and commerce basis is that after publication an intent to use application will be allowed and then the applicant will have three years from allowance to perfect that use by filing a statement of use um, and you do have to file extensions for that so that kind of like gets businesses that are interested in a trademark but don't maybe are developing a product or um, you know, a, a developing a service and like just working on that before they're ready to provide it, it lets them reserve that name, you know, for in essence, you could say three years, but also with the other rest of the um, portion of it, potentially four. So you could have four years from filing, and this is not an exact number, before you're ultimately secure your protection. All right, so now on to cannabis. So uh, yeah, so back to my, uh, my, I'm on a little educational streak. And I think this is very important because the distinctions in cannabis trademark matter. Um, and I think that the terms like cannabis, marijuana, hemp, and CBD are thrown around a lot. So I just wanna clarify like where everything stands in the hierarchy. Um, cannabis is like the overarching term that includes marijuana, hemp, and CBD. Um, when we talk about hemp and CBD, those are derived from the one of the two main strains. There's multiple mixed strains, but sativa strain. Um, hemp is generally defined as the reason like hemp is different is because it has like low THC and you can't you don't you don't get like a high from it. So it in essence has um, they use it frequently for industrial purposes. Um, it also looks different. And when we talk about CBD, we're talking about CBD that's derived from hemp because you could derive CBD from marijuana, but that CBD won't be legal because it will exceed the 3% threshold of THC. So uh, another important thing to just remember is that the United States Patent and Trademark Office is an agency of the federal government. It's overseen by the federal government. There are state trademarks, but um, those are completely separate. And I will mention them a little bit later, but but really in this presentation, we're contemplating the federal trademarks. Um, in terms of cannabis, cannabis is regulated actually by a multitude of agencies. 
um, including the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Justice. So um, there's just a multitude of cannabis laws, and they're covered by more than one agency, whereas trademarks, at least at the federal level, are really only governed by the single agency. So uh, in November of 2020, um, you know, at the at the last election, a lot there was a flurry of activity, a lot of things happened, and I update this map when I when I do this presentation, and uh, it's just like every it, it it it's ever evolving, and you can kind of see it just gives you a really great visual representation of where we are in legalization because right now legalization is only happening at the state level, and in and general the reason is that um, under a previous administration. Um, it was basically determined that as long as like your business is like not involved in crime or selling to minors and like that, 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 that the federal government was to leave the states alone and allow them to kind of determine how they wanted to govern um, cannabis on their own. So looking at this map, you can see that the green, I just, I kept it really simple, but in essence, green, green states are states with legal recreational marijuana, whether they've enacted it, but maybe haven't enacted the specific laws, like I'll give an example, New Jersey. Um, but that's where marijuana is rec recreationally legal. The blue states are where marijuana is medically legal or and or decriminalized. And then the gray states are just illegal states where there's no medical or um, or decriminalization at all. So just a straight up, but you look at it and we're looking at the map of the, of the country and you're really, and, and if we can go to the next slide, looking at it in a table, and I'm just gonna talk about the migrations um, of these states as of the last election. So four new states as of the last election being Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota have legalized. And South Dakota is interesting because they went from illegal as of November, before November 2020 to legal. So they just jumped the jump straight over. Um, District of Columbia, I just want to point out, is not a state, but it is it is legal. Can, recreational cannabis is legal in the District of Columbia. Um, the medical slash decriminalized laws too, but two of those went to recreational. And one of those being New Jersey. And I'm, I, I live in New Jersey. So I, I, it's very, it's just interesting to be in a state that's you know, moving along. And then illegal lost two states, one of those being South Dakota, which just jumped straight up to uh, recreationally legal. So just really interesting. And um, you can see that the really the vast majority of states have some kind of legalization, anticipated legalization of, of cannabis, which is just extremely exciting. So it's really just a matter of time between before cannabis becomes federally legal. So the Controlled Substances Act is important because it's kind of right now one of the main laws that is or was governing um, federal trademark law. So that's why it's important. It's not a trademark law on its own. Um, but in essence, under because of the Controlled Substances Act, you cannot federally trademark illegal substances. So if you're running like, if you're selling like a, a, a marijuana dispensary, you cannot trademark the name of your dispensary because even though it might be legal at the state level, it's certainly not legal at the federal level. Um, you know, you can't trademark cocaine. Cocaine is just straight up. There's no contemplation of legalization of cocaine as, a, as, as I'm aware of. So straight up illegal, you are not permitted to trademark anything that is federally illegal. Um, in December, 2018, there was the farm bill came into play and um, the CSA uh, was amended and they removed the definition of hemp. So the hemp that we saw in that table that was a couple of slides ago from the definition of marijuana. And, um, and, 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 and so that was like a really big deal. And, and there was already a, a huge backlog at the trademark office, but just because that like happened, there was no immediate kind of protection. And I'll discuss that a little bit later, um, but you can still secure, there is still like room to secure marijuana themed trademarks for select goods and services. So uh, this is a fun fact and some people might know this, but you can trademark like any term. And I think this is especially true with the uh, recent decision, you know, allowing uh, in terms of like the free speech and trademarks. So it's, if, if anything, it's even more opened up, but you can literally trademark any marijuana term you want. 420, Kush, Doobie, marijuana, cannabis. The issue is that the products themselves, so the product themselves cannot contain marijuana and not may not be uh, meant for direct use with marijuana. And the, the phrase that they use is plant touching. So to be trademarked, um, your product cannot be plant touching. So a no touch company will provide a product or services that re relates to the cannabis industry, but is not directly involved, does not touch the plant. So here's some just examples of things that are and have been registrable for, this is even before the farm bill, but for a while. So clothing, shoes, accessories, home decorative items, a mobile app, um, action figure, though 
uh, in the in the in the in the reading that I wrote uh, read they they mentioned that action figures should really be for not for children. So if you have a, a marijuana man action figure, this should be for adults. Uh, you know, like an adult collectible, not like a child's toy. Um, that probably would be bad PR as well. But uh, legal services, so legal legal uh, law firms that cater to um, you know cannabis companies are certainly allowed to be trademarked. Consulting services, entertainment services. If you have a marijuana documentary company called Marijuana Docs, you know you could certainly trademark it for your marijuana for your uh, uh, video production services. That would be fine. If you have like a podcast, the cannabis podcast, you could trademark the name of your podcast. Um, you know for your software for your videos. So those are things that are permitted to be registered. And here's just some examples. And these things, again, these are older registrations. So these have been around for a long time. You have, there's a 420 brand for clothing. Gondra Gourmet for cookbook. Even though I'm sure the Gondra Gourmet, I haven't looked at the cookbook, but I'm sure that it talks about, has recipes that integrate cannabis in them. The cookbook itself is not plant touching, so it is permissible. Uh, a marijuana cannabis search engine, permissible. Um, marijuana and hemp business consulting, mobile apps that have like coupons and, and inventory and dispensary. So those have all already been registered and those are not plant touching and they're a lot. But what can't, here's some examples of things that are not, you cannot trademark for a can, um, for we'll say marijuana product, which would be easier. Um, anything edible, so any cookies, cakes, candies, olive oils, bars containing marijuana cannot be trademarked. Pharmaceuticals um, contain marijuana cannot be trademarked. Drug paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia, you get around it usually by specifying that it's for tobacco or if it's like for hemp that it's, you know, minus that 3% THC threshold. If you have a specific marijuana plant strain that you've come up with, you can't trademark that under federal law. Um, if you have a marijuana dispensary, you can't trademark that. If you, even if you have two states next to each other and both states have legal marijuana, have legalized marijuana, you cannot, it is illegal. It is, it's called interstate commerce. It is illegal to transport between those state lines in theory under federal law and that transportation is is not a valid service even even with that huge if you look at my old map um, the map back there with that big chunk of states that have legalized for uh recreational um it doesn't matter that moving across state law is interstate commerce and not and not permitted um so cultivation of marijuana as agricultural service um, and dispensaries, pharmaceuticals. So these are just examples of things that you are plant touching and you cannot register a trademark for. Um, so some people have this great idea of trying to deceive the United States Patent and Trademark Office and, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, an ethical attorney and a good attorney will, of course, never will try to find you like a good way to do this without without deception and deception is never a good idea because as I mentioned, trademark examiners are attorneys themselves and they're educated and they're intelligent and you know they're not limited to the four corners of your application. They're allowed to do independent research. So um, this example, this case, they tried to trademark, somebody tried to trademark Ultra Trimmer. So Ultra Trimmer on its face has like does not mention the word marijuana, there's no tip off. And the, the, the goods was a machine that was for trimming leaves, plants, flowers and butts. Um, the trademark examiner did their research, and even though you can see the mark itself and the goods make no explicit reference to being for marijuana cultivation, um, they, the, the, it showed that it actually was. This was a, a machine that was literally contemplated for the harvesting of marijuana, and they, they, they refused the registration, finding it to be defined as illegal drug paraphernalia under the CSA. Um, and like I said, the examiner did independent research. I do want to mention, though, now, um, be, this... So this uh, decision predates the um, the farm bill of December 2018. So I think if they had filed it and it was for the uh, like a trimming machine for hemp at industrial hemp that met the definition, I think that this actually would be now allowed. And then by extension, people that were looking for a hemp trimming machine would probably be looking for a cannabis trimming machine or sorry, a marijuana trimming machine. They, uh, you know, they would just buy it. So you didn't like now you wouldn't need to hide it, but don't try, I would not, ever um, advise anybody to try to hide it by using words like flowers or herbs because they know like and they, they know like 420 is and what you know they're these aren't like uh, you know these are people like like regular people and and they know so it's not a good idea to try to to try to uh, hoodwink them and 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 this is just kind of furthering that example to just give you an idea of what to expect so when you're going to file um, you know, if you're going to file with like a marijuana themed name, like Happy Stoner Cookies, and you just like write cookies, the examiner will probably check to see or ask for you for additional, if they can't find anything, they'll ask you for additional information. And of course, your, 
you're required to respond honestly. So let's say like, is, does your product contain any, you know, any marijuana in it? And if it doesn't, there's also like potential that they could say, well, it's, uh, you know, it, it's mis it's deceptive or misdescriptive. So, um, or the case where uh, you use a, a name that's like yummy, nummy bakery has nothing to do with marijuana. Um, and you sell cookies, right? Cookies, but the goods have marijuana in them. And maybe the examiner has no reason to be tipped off because, you know, it, it, he will say, okay, yummy, nummy cookies, they're cookies. There's nothing to tell me this is marijuana. So he's like, okay, this is fine. I'll let it register. But this trademark, if you're selling marijuana cookies is going to violate the, uh, the CSA. And we don't advise this because what's going to happen is that in the future, you're going to try and enforce this trademark or you know somebody else maybe is going to want to use it, and the other the opposing side will do you know will unlike a trademark attorney or examiner at the trademark office, they're going to have more time and more resources, and they're they're going to do a much more thorough investigation, and they're going to see that you are selling these marijuana cookies, and they're going to invalidate your protection. So maybe you got your registration, but your regist registrations are not infallible. They can be canceled. They can be canceled on the basis of fraud. They can be canceled on the basis of non bona fide use. So it's definitely not advisable to you know to try to hide these facts from your attorney. Like let them try to help you get something that is good, uh, or try to like hide it from everybody and try to sneak something through because it's just not advisable practice. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about cannabidiol, uh, and I'll try to I'll try to like speed it up a little bit because I think we're we're a little rushing on time. But um, so cannabidiol is what we like to think of as the first frontier of plant touching, because cannabidiol is itself a uh, a cannabinoid, uh, except for unlike THC, the other can the other main cannabinoid, it's non intoxicating. So people, so all of a sudden, there's just been this gold rush of people. Um, you know, uh, of, of creating these CBD products and putting them to market. So uh, what's happened with the CBD? So I'm just going to quickly run through the timeline. Um, there was sometimes clients go, well, wait a minute, why do these people have a trademark registration for CBD for these products that aren't supposed to be, uh, you know, registered? And the answer is that before December 2016, there was like a brief window in time where the law didn't quite catch up. And a, the, there was like a decision or a determination that CBD was outside the scope of the CSA's definition of marijuana. And there are, as a result, some people that got on the early bandwagon of filing were able to get through and those trademarks are on the register. Um, in December 2016, they enacted a drug code and now they explicitly included CBD in the CSA's definition of marijuana. And as a result, what happened is there was a huge backlog of uh, CBD trademark applications and the USPTO started just halting those and they just stayed suspended for a long time. And the ones that did examine would usually get these two separate refusals. These are called substantive refusals, which is re a refusal on the substance of the, of the trademark. So they would refuse it because it was violation of, of the CSA because CBD was considered a part of the, uh, of the CSA's definition of marijuana. And they would also refuse it for anything that was consumable. So pharmaceutical supplements, topicals, food and drink, um, because it was a violation of the FDCA. So any of those things uh, would, all, would get a secondary refusal. Once the 2018 Farm Bill came into play and legalized industrial hemp and by extension CBD that derived from industrial hemp, um, we had to still wait because until May 2019, there was no guidance from the PTO and they weren't examining it. So once in May 2019, the Trademark Office finally issued an examination guide that would allow trademark attorneys to um, clarify how we could protect hemp and CBD trademarks now that they were federally legal and excluded from the CSA's definition. Um, so in essence, the trademark examination guide just reiterated what the, uh, what the, farm, uh, the farm bill said, which was uh, cannabis plants and derivatives, including CBD, uh, sorry, CBD that contain no more than 3% THC on a dry weight basis were now excluded from the CSA's definition of controlled substances. So now they would no longer, as long as you had that kind of definition in your goods, so it's derived from hemp or industrial hemp contains less than 3% THC, now you are no longer getting that CSA refusal as a substantive refusal. However, what's happened is that the Farm Bill actually preserved the FDA's authority to regulate products containing cannabis or cannabis derived compounds. And it means that the FDCA refusal, so that's still a barrier to products um, that contain pharmaceutical pharmaceutical supplements, topical medical products, food and drink. And that, uh, by the way, includes pet foods. Pet foods are reviewed by the FDA. I think we should all be happy about that, that they're looking out for our pets. Um, but what happened, then what happened, and this just all happened, and then Corona happened. So the FDA like was, was in the process of examining you know, CBD 
Um, and then coronavirus happened and everything got put on hold. So this is all very recent. And as of now, the FDCA refusal still stands for those products. Um, so really what happened by the, by the change of the farm bill, now we could register um, beauty products like cosmetics, hair, shampoos, conditioners, uh, uh, skincare products that contain hemp or CBD um, and hemp flour and smokables, believe it or not, because those are not under the purview of the FDA. And I just want to kind of quickly as a table that overviews um, what you can and cannot do. Um, so you can secure CBD, uh, a CBD registration for a class three, so beauty hair makeup. And the difference between class three and class five is that any class five will be a medical topical cosmetic. So if you have a medicated skincare product, you cannot. So class three will allow you to register uh, those beauty products. And now there's a huge pro proliferation and uh, because people are really excited, they can get that. You can get your, um, your uh, rolling papers, your hemp flour for smoking, those can be registered, but anything with food, unless it has 0% CBD. So I'm just gonna talk quickly about that. Those are like hemp seeds in, are inherently free of THC and therefore have 0% CBD. And so anything like hemp seed, hemp seed oil, hulled hemp seeds are permitted registration in classes 5, 29 and 30. So that's actually like kind of a good way to sneak in those classes that otherwise you wouldn't get if you can, if you have a hemp seed product to reserve your right to those classes until the FDA has a chance to get back to reviewing CBD. And this is something I really wanna caution people who do make um, any CBD or hemp products. You are not permitted, if your product labeling has any claims, health claims to treat or cure or help anything, like you will get a refusal. So it's very important that your labeling not make any health claims at your website, not make any health claims. The trademark examiners will check that because those health claims cannot be um, verified by the FDA. And if you have those health claims on your product, it's going to be, it's going to create a, a basis for refusal. All right. So um, in essence, that kind of just summarizes. So I'm just going to go through a quick, a quick summary of um, cannabis alternate protection strategies for cannabis trademarks. So we already kind of talked about the federal one. The big one is to try to get goods and services as close as uh, legal goods and services as close as possible, you know, to your uh, marijuana uh, business that we can get in order to get you protection to kind of save your spot until, uh, you know, uh, marijuana is federally legal. Um, there is common law protection, but it's kind of, um, you know, uh, the, it, it's kind of like, it, that would be more of a litigation thing. And then the question is like, how will it be recognized? Like, it, it, because there is no federal common, you know, there's no federal uh, protection of marijuana. So how can you really have common law? There's been some litigation on that, but it's definitely up in the air. It's not a great I think as of now, it's not a great strategy for protection. There are state trademark registrations, which you can do. Um, that's honest. The, the problem is that there's 50 states and you're gonna have to register in each one of those states to get protection. Some states explicitly recognize protection of cannabis trademarks, others do not. Um, some states require that you be a licensed attorney in that state in order to file a, a trademark at all. Others do not, anybody could file that trademark, but then you're looking at, it's gonna get very expensive um, if you're going to go the state approach and you're going to try and, and get every state, of course, if you have the budget for it, it's definitely a good approach. Um, and just remember that the state trademark protection is only within that state. So another state is not obligated to recognize, you know, your trademark. So if you were too late, somebody else could, in theory, precede you even like in a neighboring state. Like, so you, you may have your trademark in California, but somebody else beat you to it in Oregon. So that's kind of just a quick overview. And then the last one is copyright registration. There's no federal prohibition on cannabis or marijuana or anything for copyrights. Um, but there, there is kind of like, um, you're gonna require at least a minimum, like a, a significant amount of creativity. And I wanna, it's usually minimal, but they become very strict with copyrighted logos. So your logo should really be very, um, I, I would advise it be somewhat intricate in order to get that, but pr product packaging should probably be okay. But like the more kind of designed, the better, the easier it will be to protect because the trademark office does crack down on copyrights that they view to be too simplistic and you can't copyright a word or a phrase. That's the purview of trademark. So I think that kind of covers um, the most basic parts.